Hello, my name is Blake Whitaker, and I'm a Doctor of Pharmacy candidate in the class of 2009, for the class of 2019 at the Wingate University School of Pharmacy. And today I'll be talking to you about the role of teotropium in asthma. A few objectives from the presentation today will include to define the stages of asthma, identify risk factors and common triggers of asthma, discuss current guideline recommended treatment of asthma. Describe basic pharmacologic information about teotropium, including its indications, mechanism of action, dosing, and adverse events. And finally, to examine current evidence about teotropium's use in asthma. So what is asthma? Asthma is a disease of chronic airway inflammation and airway hyperresponsiveness to certain triggers. These triggers can include medications, physical exertion, specific allergens, or even an emotional response to something. The characteristic symptoms of asthma include wheezing, chest tightness, shortness of breath, and a cough. This is just a graphic that will tell you a little more about the pathophysiology of asthma. As you can see, you have a specific trigger, like we mentioned before, that leads to the activation of airway mast cells and macrophages. Um, Pro-inflammatory mediators will eventually result in airway contractions and ultimately bronchoconstriction, leading to the asthma exacerbation. So there are a couple of guidelines to note for the treatment of asthma. The first is the Global Strategy for Asthma Management and Prevention, or better known as the GINA report. This guideline was last updated in 2018, so it was updated this year, and it's typically updated yearly, and it's considered a global guideline. The next is the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines. These were last updated in 2007. So you'll see it's been quite a while since they've updated this guideline, and it's considered an American guideline, so it's a national guideline. Looking at the classifications of asthma, um, classification is mainly based on the frequency of the asthma symptoms. We discussed a couple of slides back. This chart specifically focuses on the classification severity in asthma patients who are greater than or equal to 12 years of age, so adolescents and adults. And this is from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines. So you'll see in intermittent asthma, patients have symptoms less than or equal to two days per week. Nighttime awakenings come less than or equal to two times a month. Short-acting beta agonist use is less than or equal to two days a week. And you'll see for interference of normal activity, there's really none with intermittent asthma. In mild asthma, you'll see symptoms greater than two days a week, but not daily. Nighttime awakenings will be three to four times a month. The short-acting beta agonist use will be greater than two days per week, but not greater than one time a day. And you'll see there's minor limitations on normal activity in patients who have mild asthma. In moderate asthma, symptoms will typically occur daily. The nighttime awakenings will happen greater than one time a week, but not quite nightly. Um, short-acting beta agonist use for symptom control will be required daily. And you'll see there's some more limitation than mild on normal physical exertion or normal activity. In severe asthma, the symptoms will persist throughout the day. Nighttime awakenings will occur often seven times a week, so almost daily at least. And then short-acting beta agonist use will be required several times throughout the day as well. And you'll see that this severe asthma will, will limit patients severely on their normal activity. Looking at the GINA report treatment, so it's based on the classification, as we mentioned before. In intermittent asthma, step one, a short-acting beta agonist as needed is sufficient. If you step up and we have mild asthma, a low-dose inhalical steroid can be initiated at this point. When you step up to moderate asthma, you'll see a low-dose inhalical steroid will be used in combination with a long-acting beta agonist. And then finally, in steps four and five, which is the more severe category, you'll see a medium or a high dose inhaled corticosteroid in combination with a long-acting beta agonist. You also see the option to add on teotropium based on the patient's severity and symptoms. So looking specifically at teotropium, this is an image I included just to give a visual of kind of what it looks like. As you'll see, it's a soft mist inhaler. In order to prepare a dose, patient will twist the piercing element at the bottom in order to prepare its use and press the dose release button. So 
So T-tropium actually comes in two forms. It comes in the soft mist inhaler, as you saw on the previous slide, and it also comes as a hand inhaler, which requires the physical insertion of a capsule, as seen on screen. For purposes of this, of this presentation, we'll focus mostly on the T-tropium um, which is the one you saw the soft mist inhaler on the slide before. It comes as a 1.25 microgram per inhalation formulation, and the dose is typically two inhalations once daily. And the mechanism of action, so it's a long-acting muscarinic antagonist. It competitively and reversibly inhibits acetylcholine at the type 3 muscarinic receptors and bronchial smooth muscle. This in turn allows for smooth muscle relaxation and ultimately bronchodilation. Some common adverse effects seen in teotropium, you'll see dry mouth, it's reported in about 16% of cases. Pharyngitis is also reported in 16% of cases. And finally, an upper respiratory tract infection, which can happen in about 43% of patients. This is a good visual of the mechanism of action of the muscarinic antagonist and kind of how they work. You can see that the muscarinic antagonists work at the M3 receptor and prevent acetylcholine's action, which would normally lead to bronchoconstriction, which would worsen asthma. But because we're using an antagonist and it's blocked, you get that smooth muscle relaxation and ultimately bronchodilation. So a few basic counseling points to tell every patient who is just starting teotropium and may not have used an inhaler before. I wanted to compare it to a metered dose inhaler just to see a couple of differences. So looking at the metered dose inhaler specifically, you want to shake the inhaler, hold it upright, exhale completely, place the mouthpiece in your mouth above the tongue, depress the device, Take a slow, deep breath in and hold your breath for 10 seconds if you can. And finally, exhale. For the soft mist inhaler, or teotropium, you want to remove the mouthpiece, which pops off at the top. Turn the base until it clicks into place. Hold the inhaler upright. Exhale completely. Place the mouthpiece above the tongue and be careful not to cover the air vents. Inhale slowly and press the button. This will activate the mist. Hold your breath for 10 seconds and then exhale. So looking at some of the indications for teotropium, it was approved in 2014 for maintenance therapy in COPD only. So its first major approval was actually in COPD and not asthma. Then in 2015, it finally gained its approval for asthma, which led to it being introduced in the GINA guidelines in 2015. Currently, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute guidelines have no recommendation for teotropium and asthma. It could be because of their lack of updates. As we mentioned before, this guideline has not been updated since around 2007. But it still begs the question, what is the utilization for, of teotropium in asthma patients? So I looked at a study, a systematic review and meta-analysis, that was titled, What is the Role of Teotropium in Asthma? Looking at the study overview, the meta-analysis was conducted with 13 randomized controlled studies, and it included 4,966 total patients. Its purpose was to assess strictly the efficacy and safety of teotropium in asthma patients, and they did this by using three separate protocols. So these protocols included teotropium as an add-on to inhaled corticosteroids, teotropium in combination with an inhaled corticosteroid, versus a long-acting beta agonist plus an inhaled corticosteroid, and teotropium as an add-on to long-acting beta agonists plus an inhaled corticosteroid. The primary efficacy outcome of the study was improvement in forced expiratory volume or peak expiratory flow rate. Secondary efficacy outcomes were symptom-free days, asthma control, which was assessed using the asthma control questionnaire, quality of life, exacerbation rates, and rescue medication use. Looking at some of the notable study characteristics, in order to be included, the studies had to have adults and adolescents greater than 12 years of age of any severity receiving at least an inhaled corticosteroid or an inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist. And each randomized controlled trial included had to be at least four weeks in duration. Every study but one studied the Spreva-Respimat device, 
the one study that did not actually looked at the Spiriva hand inhaler, and most participants in the study were of moderate to severe severity. Looking at the primary outcome results, once again, the primary outcomes were changes in forced expiratory volume and peak expiratory flow rate. So looking at the three protocols they looked at, the first, teotropium as an add-on to inhaled corticosteroid, you'll see a change in the AM and PM peak expiratory flow rate was 22 liters per minute and 24 liters per minute, respectively. And the change in the peak and trough forced expiratory volume was 150 milliliters and 140 milliliters. And these were both found to be statistically significant. Teotropium plus an inhaled corticosteroid versus a long-acting beta agonist plus an inhaled corticosteroid was the second protocol. It found no significant difference in peak expiratory flow rate or forced expiratory volume. And then finally, the third protocol, which was teotropium as an add-on to, lo to a long-acting beta agonist plus an inhaled corticosteroid. You see the change in AM and PM peak expiratory flow rate was 16 liters per minute and 20 liters per minute. So we see improvements in the groups that did have teotropium as an add-on. And then the change in peak and trough forced expiratory volume was 120 milliliters and 80 milliliters, respectively. And these were found to be statistically significant. Looking at the secondary outcome results, um, looking at the first protocol, teotropium as an add-on to the inhaled corticosteroids, patients experiencing at least one exacerbation was 10.5% in the teotropium group versus 13.3% in the group who did not have teotropium as an add-on. And there was no other significant differences in this protocol. In the second protocol, which is teotropium plus an inhaled corticosteroid versus a long-acting beta agonist plus an inhaled corticosteroid, found that the use of rescue inhalers was decreased by roughly 0.2 inhalations per day in the long-acting beta agonist group. And then there were no other significant differences found. And the third and final protocol, teotropium as an add-on to long-acting beta agonists plus an inhaled corticosteroid found that patients experiencing at least one exacerbation was 18.2% in the teotropium group versus 24% in the group that did not have teotropium as an add-on. Regarding safety in the study, overall it was noted that teotropium was pretty well tolerated across the board among all patients, and there were no potential safety signals that the investigators identified in the study. Uh, this was likely because the adverse events of teotropium are very mild in nature, <clears throat> but the adverse events to be mostly concerned about, like we mentioned before, are dry mouth, pharyngitis, and that upper respiratory tract infection. Moving into the Discussion. This analysis actually has the largest amount of information available regarding the use of teotropium in mild to severe asthma. It also has the most patients that have been included in one single study um, regarding this subject. <clears throat> Looking at the three protocols, teotropium as an add-on to an inhaled corticosteroid improved lung function and actually reduced exacerbation rates. <clears throat> teotropium given in combination to an inhaled corticosteroid is not inferior to an inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist. So it may be a good alternative to the long-acting beta agonists. In poorly controlled asthmatics, the addition of teotropium to an inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist regimen increased pulmonary function and actually reduced the exacerbation rates. <clears throat> Looking into the strengths and limitations of this study, some of the strengths were that it was a large population size, so a lot of patients were evaluated and enrolled. Remember, it was about 4,966 patients in total. The study considered only randomized controlled trials, so they studied strongly designed trials, and they evaluated a variety of patients. So we saw patients from mild to severe classification and patients who were of adolescent age, so 12 and beyond. The limitations of the study, some studies were not peer-reviewed, so they might have been poorly designed studies or not good enough to be published. And some studies' treatment duration was actually too short, so not long enough to see an effect of the intervention. Looking at the author's conclusions specifically, the meta-analysis suggests in patients with moderate to severe asthma who are not adequately controlled on an inhaled corticosteroid plus or minus a long-acting beta agonist that teotropium is non-inferior to long-acting beta agonists. 
teotropium is superior to placebo in general, and that teotropium, when added to an inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist, has added benefit in lung function and reducing the risk of exacerbations. They also noted that teotropium may be an alternative to long-acting beta agonists in patients with mild to moderate asthma. So my overall recommendation specifically, based on the evidence, teotropium or spirivaresvimat should be utilized as add-on therapy in patients who are greater than 12 years of age with severe asthma uncontrolled with an inhaled corticosteroid plus a long-acting beta agonist, and they can also be used to reduce exacerbations and improve lung functions. Teotropium can also be used as an alternative to long-acting beta agonists in patients who are greater than 12 years of age with mild to severe asthma, specifically in patients who cannot tolerate a long-acting beta agonist. These are my references. I hope this presentation has been informative and you'll find it helpful going forward in your clinical practice. Thank you for listening.